We do anything for kids. Yet one in six children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Month's salute to service and with me today I have retired Colonel Dave Taylor. Dave, how you doing? Good. Good to see you again. Um, welcome and Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I hope everybody had a good Christmas and New Year's uh, season and here we are in 2018. So Dave, you are a Medina County resident as mm -hmm. most are. Where do, you, where do you hail from? Well, originally I was born in Philadelphia and uh, as a very young child we moved to southern New Jersey and that's where I was raised and uh, when I went into the Army in 1968 I never went back to New Jersey. No, uh, Fort Dix, right? <laughs> Fort Dix, and um, but New Jersey and, and Philadelphia, that area was just too crowded. Uh, just lost my taste for it, and uh, so I never went back, and I ended up here in Ohio. So when you went into the service, did you enlist, or were you commissioned in? Uh, I was an unusual case. I wanted to go in the Army. Uh, I was tired of college, and I wanted to try to get an officer candidate school. But if I couldn't get in, I didn't want to be stuck with a three-year enlistment. Right. Uh, my goal was to go to Vietnam, see what that was all about. And so I volunteered for the draft. The draft board said, you really are, probably aren't going to get drafted. Go back to college. And I said, no, I don't want to go back to college. So, so I got drafted. Mm -hmm. But then uh, I took the test for officer candidate school. I scored high. And so I went in. And um, so I ended up spending four years on active duty. So you went in as a lieutenant? Uh, I was after commissioning. No, I, at first I had to go through basic, right. and then uh, at Fort um, Dix, and then advanced individual infantry training at Fort McClellan, Alabama, and then uh, six months of OCS, and then I got commissioned. So you went over there as a platoon leader, probably. Correct. Yeah. So how how is it? Uh, Nineteen, twenty years old, right? Mm -hmm. How old were you? I was uh, actually twenty-two. Twenty-two. Because so I had two years Still pretty college. young, though. Twenty-two-year-old yeah, sure kid. Hitting the ground in Vietnam as a platoon leader. So mm -hmm. some responsibility there. You're not just a private carrying a rifle and a pack on your back. What's that like? Well, first of all, I was well trained. Uh, six months of infantry officer candidate school. Uh, the washout rate was pretty hard. So you, so you really had to work hard and diligent. Uh, and they spent a lot of time on company and battalion tactics. And then I was fortunate enough to get into the Army Airborne School to jump out of perfectly good planes. And then I got into Ooh. the Army. Yeah. <laughs> and then I uh, went into the Army Ranger School uh, where there was a big washout rate, but I was fortunate enough to graduate and receive the Ranger tab. So I was very well trained uh, for infantry uh, service. How long did you do in Vietnam? I only made it four and a half months. Uh, I was shot twice and I was hit in the head, neck and ear with shrapnel. Uh, had a bout of malaria. Welcome to the infantry. Mm -hmm. And um, the day that I was shot twice, uh, I received a, a wound in the lower right leg that broke the tibia and the fibula. So that was all, all was for Vietnam, and I was sent home. So you come back to Fort Dix, spent some time in the yes. hospital, from what I remember mm -hmm. you telling me. Yeah. And you met your lovely wife there, didn't you? I did. Uh, she was an Army nurse from Cleveland, Ohio. She was taking the operating room course. Uh, and we met at a social gathering, and it was pretty much love at first sight. And so um, uh, over a period, let's see, I met her in October. We were engaged in January and married the following July. So as I like to tell people, uh, the Army issued me a wife. 
So she, her story is she patched up a couple times, she might as well keep you. That's what she said. Well, no, well her, family, her family thought she patched me up, but she didn't. She was in this course for the operating room. And uh, so we met at a social thing and, and started dating. And at, at the time, I was on outpatient status in the nurses' quarters across the lawn from the right. hospital because half of the nurses were in Vietnam. And so they put us in one building and, and the nurses in the other. And uh, it was a, a really nice time to get to know people. And we slowly developed the relationship that we they had. So the, the Taylor family has a history of service, not just in the military, but even here in the community. Mm -hmm. And I know you spent quite a bit of time on your book, Our War, mm -hmm. um, doing the research and mm -hmm. writing that book took an immense amount of work. Um, and I know the book's not just about you or you. you right. It's about, it's about the Marical Division. Um, but tell me a little bit about what went into put, writing that book. Well, um, because I left uh, after uh, four and a half months my battalion, uh, as I got on in life, and, and I took an early retirement from the business world at the age of 57, and I always wondered what happened to my battalion before I got there, uh, and then what happened after I left. Right. And so since I retired early from the business world, I took some time to locate people. I spent a considerable amount of time at the National Archives uh, in the infantry battalions of Vietnam. Um, they had a, what they called a battalion daily staff journal. Right. And you would have a lieutenant and a sergeant who finished their field duty. They would be recording everything that's going on. They would be in a tactical operations center with the, the radios blaring and they'd be writing everything down. And a typical day, you may get anywhere from 13 to 30 pages of entries. Well, I was fortunate enough at the National Archives, all of those daily journals made it back after the war to the National Archives for the three years and three months that the battalion was in Vietnam. So it ended up being a collection of 20,000 pages. And I copied them all. Mm -hmm. And that was my source document for the book. Uh, and then I had a field map that I had in my home office so I could read the grid coordinate, look at the field map, see where it was, describe it for the reader. And, um, and then I ended up locating and interviewing about 120 members of the battalion, including some of the battalion commanders. And then at the brigade level, I received the operational reports uh, from the National Archives as well. Yeah, the book reads kind of like a documentary, but yet there's still a story there that you're, you're yeah, telling. Yeah, it's, it's uh, written in a narrative form. Um, you're going to be in the grass with the battalion right. for three and a half years. And um, when it was first published in 2011, um, I went out to the individuals that I had located from the battalion. At that point, it was about 150. Mm -hmm. And they all bought books. And I just held my breath because they would be the biggest critic. Right. They were there in the arena. Right. And to a man, they loved it. They loved it, and they appreciated me writing it. It told their story, not about me, right. their story. And um, uh, so, and then they ended up, after they read the book, they ended up, each one of them bought two or three copies for their children. For their friends, they yeah. wanted them to know what it was like in there, Vietnam. Yeah. So I'm very gratified by that. So I remember when the book came out and I had read it. It, it, it. I liked it, I enjoyed it, because it was not just someone's story. But then it wasn't just a documentary either. There right. was kind of that, that go between. So you were reading a yeah. story, but yet there were hard facts that were also involved yeah. in there that, that I enjoyed about. And you still had the books for sale, am I correct? Oh, yes. It's uh, now in its third printing. Okay. I did two um, printings of hardcover, and then uh, we're now in the printing of softcover to get the price down. After, the, after you know, Vietnam and you come back mm -hmm. and, and you, you get married, obviously, you went on to the reserves because I mm -hmm. know you retired as a colonel. Mm -hmm. um, and where did you serve in the reserves at? Well, it was happenstance. Uh, I had made a decision. I left the Army, <coughs> and my wife was still at uh, Fort Jackson where we both were. And um, so I went back to the University of South Carolina to get my degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as that was finishing, I have a degree in business management. Um, I interviewed with the B.F. Goodrich Company. Because I, I really wanted to go to Ohio. I was just fell in love with Ohio. Right. And so I was fortunate enough to be invited in their management program. And, and then I thought about it. And it's like, you know, I put a lot of training into my four years of active duty. I'd like to go in the reserve. And the only infantry Army Reserve in the state of Ohio was Special Forces. Right. 
And so I wrote to them and said, here's my background. I liked it. And they said, come on on board. And uh, so over a period of two years, uh, I did various pieces of training and, and other things to get qualified in the, in the special forces. And that's, that's where I was for the next 22 years. So did any of that training carry over to your civilian sector? I mean, how does the two complement each yes, other? Yes, very much so, because especially since my um, career was in the business world, um, the, the things that I learned in the Army about organization, advanced planning, always looking ahead, what are the ifs and, of, of things that you will encounter, uh, just stuck with me. And, I, and the, the, the one example um, which I think stood me well in the civilian world was uh, when I was in ranger school, you're supposed to lead so many patrols and successfully lead them. Right. Uh, and uh, the first patrol I had, we were up in the Georgia mountains and I was supposed to put together a patrol order. And so I, I went out to different people in our little group okay you do this part you do this part this and of course everybody was just tired no sleep but so we did that and um and it, the whole thing fell apart right <laughs> it, it just came undone and, was, and i learned that lesson and um in my business career i ran a lot of business teams i started a new business unit for the company i have my name on as a co-inventor on two patents but I was always successful with business teams because I never started out with a blank piece of paper. Uh, as the team leader, I always set the vision. Here's where I want to go. Mission, here's state, a, mission statement. Right, right, precisely. Yeah, yeah. And here's where I think we need to do yeah. it. And then the other members of the team, the, the finance guy, the production planning guy, and uh, logistics and everything, I was like, I want you to take this apart. Right. Tell me where I'm missing things. You're the subject experts. But the leader has to put that out in front. They have to put the vision and the mission. I think the military decision-making process transfers over to the civilian world. Oh, really, yeah. Really good. I mean, I, I even catch myself many times using, you know, okay, here's my mission statement, here's my op order, and you go through the different, you know, courses of action and stuff like that, and, and you don't even realize you're doing it, but it does, it, it transfers real well into the civilian Yeah, sector. and then uh, in, um, I retired in 2003, and in the mid-'90s, uh, I had six weeks of vacation mm -hmm. from the company, and I don't golf. And so I started a side business called the Business War College, mm -hmm. uh, how to use military thinking in the business right. world. And it was very lucrative, um, uh, and I received a lot of business from it. And we did some war gaming and of the business. And so they really, the really civilian uh, community really took that in. Right. Now, now it's totally reversed. The military, it seems, is following the lead of the business yeah, world, which I don't aspect. agree. I, I think in the logistic aspects, but I, yeah. I knew a lot of friends that uh, when I retired, and even before I retired, that retired, they started uh, counseling uh, businesses that were going out to you yeah. know, civilian sectors and basically coaching them on how to do decision making, team mm -hmm. building, things like that, which the military does really well. Yes, they um, do. And, and the business sector was realizing, well, how do I get better teams? How do I make people more cohesive mm -hmm. and stuff like that? Yep. Um, so you, you came home, you've been in Medina for quite a few years. And like I said, I know the Taylor family has a history of service. Um, what are you doing currently uh, in Medina? I mean, what, what, what's been going on in the last few years with you? Well, I, I love to write, and so I still write military history. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and in my Army Division Association, I'm the uh, World War II historian. And so um, I write about World War II, uh, and I also write about Vietnam. Uh, I guess my biggest article was in the American Legion magazine uh, a couple years ago when they were f featuring the Vietnam War commemoration mm -hmm. every month. And one fellow found out about me, and, and one thing led to another, and I did a, um, the cover story one month on uh, the infantry in Vietnam. Okay. And that was 1.2 million circulation, so that was the biggest one right. that I've done. But along from that, in the... Um, the local uh, community, um, I've been very involved uh, with the, some of the local veterans organizations. And uh, back a few years ago, it was decided that our Medina County Veterans Memorial Hall really needed some modernization. It had no air conditioning. It was built in 1956. Uh, no paved parking. Right. And we're not, we were not bringing people in that we needed to for these organizations using the hall because it was just really right pretty bad and so uh i took the charge on that and led the, led the capital campaign we raised a half million dollars 
in, inside of two years and we were able to modernize that and, and now we're seeing the fruits of that more people are joining the organizations that use it's a home. beautiful hall too i mean it yeah looks, it is. Look, looks similar on the outside but once you get inside it's it's beautiful yeah inside. yeah wi-fi sounds yeah. around yeah, big nice. screen that comes out of the, yeah. and um so it's it's really opened the doors for for us and in my case the american legion post that i'm the commander of uh in order to engage other groups and uh, we just in november alone uh we had two sets of students come there and we had um over 90 students wow. and faculty come from the Claggett Middle School, the eighth grade, those that could not go on the uh, Washington trip because right. they couldn't afford it. And then there's a new school in Medina called Evolve Academy and the special kids. And they came as well on two separate dates. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're doing that. We wouldn't be able to do that if we had the old hall. So you, recently you were inducted into the Veterans Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And that's quite an honor, and, and, and yeah. I mean, very humbling, I assume. But uh, oh, yeah. what what got you into the Hall of Fame? How did? Well, um, I knew that the Hall of Fame existed because Ralph Waite, one of our right. uh, icons in uh, uh, Medina, was in that several years ago. Yeah, we have Medina's got several. For being a small county, we actually got several, several. in the in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, we do. And um, but I so I knew it existed. Mm -hmm. I have a very good friend in Pine Mountain, Georgia, who was one of our company commanders in my battalion in Vietnam. Very good company commander. And by locating him to write my book, we reconnected. And so through the years, we constantly went back and forth, either by phone or, or email. And unbeknownst to me, uh, several years ago, he started the State of uh, Georgia Veterans Hall of, Hall of Fame. And so when I... He's telling me what's going on in his life. I'm telling him what I'm doing. And when we finished the capital campaign, uh, and then I, I was doing some other things, he said, Dave, I, I noticed that Ohio has a Veterans Hall of Fame. Uh, I want to uh, nominate you, because I, I know what's required, and right. I think you have a shot at getting in. And I said, don't bother with it. I'm not interested. I was recognized by the county, the Veterans Coalition. I said, nah. And then he came back with another email and he said, what about your grandchildren? That's what it's all about. At this yeah, point. what about your grandchildren? And uh, I said, okay. I said, if you want to do all the work, go ahead. And so that was the process. And as it turned out, it was just a beautiful, very humbling uh, to be there when you, when you look at uh, all the others and what, what they've done. And uh, when the head of the uh, Hall of Fame called me, um, in August to, to tell me that I was going to be inducted, the, the numbers were staggering. Right. Uh, there were 102 applications and they only picked 20. And then he told me that since that began in the early 1990s by Governor George Voinovich, uh, there's a little over 800 that are in the Hall of Fame. And that includes a lot of deceased members who were Medal of Honor recipients. Right. And he said, so, so from early 90s to now, uh, a little over 800 in the Hall of Fame, and just consider that Ohio has over 800,000 veterans. So it's, it's mind-boggling. It's a, it's a, it's a it's, pretty special yeah. group, yeah. It is, it is, it is. It is. It is. Well, I, I, know, I know a couple years ago you were the Veteran of the Year here in Medina County. Mm -hmm. Now you're in the Ohio Veterans mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. Um, and all that, all that is, the accolades are, are well worth mm -hmm. what you do. I know you do a lot for our veterans. Um, in the community, and, and I, I know I've called mm -hmm. you and asked you favors mm -hmm. to help veterans out. And, and that goes back to the organizations that you belong to. And I know you're a commander of the American Legion right now and, and probably belong to other organizations. But what are those organizations, what do you see the benefit of those organizations? Not just the external benefit for the community, but the internal benefit for the veterans that belong to them. Uh, without a doubt, camaraderie. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a chance to just be with people that, that had the similar experiences. And uh, it's one of the things the school children asked us uh, in November when they came over to the hall, what did you get out of it? And, and every person to a, a man and a woman, uh, my wife was there as an Army nurse, and they all said, uh, uh, we matured. We matured. And uh, it, it made us who we are today. Right. And one student <clears throat> said, well, because some of us had been in war, and, and the one student asked the question, well, all of you would, knowing what you went through and everything, would you do it again? 
and every one of us put our hands up. So, yes, yeah. And I think that shocked the kids. Yeah. It's like, wow, that must have been some kind of experience. Even, even if you were in, in war, and in my case, won it several times, what an experience to somebody to say, yeah, I'd do it again. Well, I think looking at those kids makes it easy to say that too, because it's mm -hmm. all about them. It really is. It's all yeah. about the children. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it's strange because I know the younger generation, you know, we're trying to get them to join the organizations and everything. And I know for, for me, you know, years ago when I had joined, I was much younger than I am today. Yeah. <laughs> but part of what I got out of it was actually talking to the, the older folks that were there because you mm -hmm. realize that, you know, you can pull a vet from World War II and you can pull a vet from Iraq. The stories, other than the equipment and everything else, the stories are very similar. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it doesn't change a whole lot. You know, I mean, being in the service is being in the service, whether mm -hmm. it was 80 years ago or whether it was last week. Yep. Um, you know, some of the, obviously the gear's gotten a lot better and the weapon systems and stuff, but it's still cold, dirty, hard, and, That's and, right. and, and ups and downs and everything else. So what do the organizations do for the community? I mean, what, I, I, and I know tons of things, but tell our viewers, what, what, do you, what do you see that the American Legion and the other organizations, how, do they, how are they an asset to the folks that live in Medina County? Well, first and foremost, I think veterans organizations in any local community around the country, uh, I think they're the conscience of the community in terms of Americanism mm -hmm. and, and always making sure that, that um, citizens understand that their freedom is not free. Right. And so we're the conscience for that. Uh, but also, I mean, we, we served, we learned how to serve and not to be served right. when we went in the military. And that still is with us today. And so we do have an opportunity not only to serve our fellow veterans, but uh, the community in general. And, and we do quite a bit of that, uh, all of the organizations right. do. And we get a pleasure out of doing that, we really do. And so uh, I, I, I think uh, any, community in America, if they don't have some veterans organizations, uh, they're missing something. They are. Yeah, and I, I, in, in the service, I, I don't think people realize that as veterans, we have to serve. We, I mean, it's, right. it's, it's in our DNA. You know, we want to continue what we did in the service. And, and for a lot of communities, um, you know, we don't have Fort Benning here in Medina County. So mm -hmm. for a lot of communities like ours, the veterans organizations are the military. Right. I mean, they are the link to the military because there isn't a large post. I know we have the National Guard mm -hmm. and, and we, we you know do different things with the Guard and stuff, but you know the vets are the, the, the military and that's how people get to know the military. Is yeah, the I know uh, during the induction of the uh, Veterans Hall of Fame, uh, the state senator that gave us our plaques, he, he said a few words and it, and it takes right to your point. He said, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, all of you veterans are marked people right. and you're going to serve and you're going to continue to serve because that's who you are and you're going to serve until the day you die. Right. And he's right. He's right. Yeah. It's just in our blood. Yeah. I, I always tell, uh, you know, younger gals and girls that serve, you know, get involved mm -hmm. um, because it is a community and a family and, and the organizations yeah. have changed to where they're much more family oriented because all of our younger uh, men and women, they all they all got families. It's not like years ago where, you know, smaller portion of the service was married. Now, right. now a lot right. of them are married. So. And we're we're looking at that because, as you know, we're trying to put together a uh, a new organization called the Desert Veterans of mm -hmm. Medina County for those who have uh, served in a, a global war on global terrorism, particularly in Afghanistan and Iraq. And uh, what we're finding is these are younger folks, and they have families that they're raising. So the the, um, the blueprint is a little different with them. And we're putting together an organization where we will have family activities. Uh, and this summer we will have several uh, right there at the Veterans Hall. Right. We'll have play things for the children and, and uh, outdoor activities and that kind of thing and, and make it family oriented. That's what they want. Right, and so, I, know, I know a lot of people are always asking me, well, hey, what can I do to help the veterans? But I don't think people realize is that the veterans help the community a lot. Oh, yeah. You know, they give a lot back to the community. Yeah. Food drives, clothing drives, things Absolutely. like that. All sorts of stuff. We've got a couple minutes left. What, do you, what, what would you want to, you know, tell our, our anybody, whether it's a younger vet, or whether it's an older vet, a Vietnam veteran, what would you want to tell them uh, about joining the organizations? Or what do you want to tell our younger viewers about the military? I, I think uh, for the veterans, the younger veterans in particular, don't, uh, 
recognizing that you have families to raise, you have careers to, to work on and that kind of thing, but don't give up your status as a veteran. Keep some of that in your life uh, because it will do a lot more for you than, than you can possibly do for it. And I think that's real important. And I think uh, younger people, uh, school students, uh, that are considering possibly going into the military, I think it's up to us to let them know that the, the advantages of doing right. that, if it's right for them. And um, uh, they'll see things, they'll do things, they'll have an experience they can't possibly ever have. That You can't duplicate military service, you right. just can't. Right. And when we talk to these groups and we tell them how mature that made us as as people and better people. Right. Uh, I think they're getting the message. So yeah, I don't think there's a day that goes by that I don't draw on some part of my military yep. experience for my daily life. I mean, yep. whether it's family, whether it's work, whatever it is, I, it, you're constantly drawing back on that experience. Absolutely. Um, I ask everybody that's come on the show mm -hmm. if you had the opportunity to do it all over again, would you do it again? Yes, I would. Uh, <laughs> I do remember on uh, one day on the 3rd of June, 1969, when I got shot twice, I think in that action, I would have zigged instead, instead of zagged. Zag. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully I would have avoided the uh, uh, getting shot in the leg. That's the wound that took me. I got shot in the side. Uh, it opened it up eight inches, but I didn't get a stomach wound. And I think I could have stayed with that. But the leg wound was, um, but I was fortunate. I was fortunate. I had three men, three of my men were killed by my side that day. So um, uh, I guess God had other plans for me and one of them was to issue me a wife. <laughs> right. And so you don't question that, you just get on with life. And, and, and we're glad for those other plans. We're glad to have you here as a Medina County resident. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I glad love to have you involved in all that you do for our veterans. I wanna congratulate you again on the honor of being inducted into the Ohio Veterans Hall of Fame. And uh, we hope to, Keep seeing you plug away and work with the veterans here in Medina County. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And if you'd like to be on Salute to Service, please call my office at 330-722-9368, and we can arrange it to hear your story about your service. Thank you, and have a good new year. probably sober. Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home, just in case. If you're probably sober, then why would you do that? Good choice. Probably okay isn't okay. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. That's a full glass of wine. I'll be chatting you later. We'd do anything for kids. Yet one in six children in the U.S. struggle with hunger. Help end childhood hunger near you. Learn how at feedingamerica.org. Your daughter just had her first breakup. Do you A, put yourself in her shoes? B, console her? Don't worry, sweetie. This is gonna happen a lot. Or C, find her a new boyfriend. Nice single boys. <laughs> that was
was weird. As a parent, there are no perfect answers. But you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same.